Okay, welcome in. This is the Thursday deep dive episode with Ian Gray. I'm looking in front of me uh, for anyone that's on the video. We've got the physical Wall Street Journal here. Ryan is uh, subscribing to that now. So we got a little, right. uh, yeah, I, I don't know. We're going, we're going old school. Ryan's going for his old man, old man ways there. I need slippers, but once I get the slippers, my day will be complete. My whole morning will be complete. I've got yeah. coffee, Wall Street Journal. Oh. Uh, and then I give you the day old. So I have a data advantage over you. Yes. And I get the student discount. My life's good right now. Yes. There we go. Ian, uh, you're welcoming, uh, or sorry, you're on the show with us today. Uh, what do you think? Wall Street Journal physical copy is this, uh, is this strange or would you ever subscribe? I would be, I would be tempted to subscribe, but I might be a little too cheap even for the student discount, but it's, uh, I think you're right. You know, reading the Wall Street Journal, even if it's not giving you good, valuable information, I'm sure it is. But even if it's not, it's at least making you feel like you're sophisticated. Yeah, exactly. No, that's yeah. What, I mean, that's what, that's what really matters. Yeah, no notifications on there. It helps, uh, you know, not get distracted by other things when you're reading on like a tablet or something like that. But that's not what the show is about. We're talking good RX. They are a healthcare platform uh, a bit confusing but i'll introduce it over to ryan to talk about them but first mm. we have to talk about our friends at seven investing whose turn is it to pitch it me or you ryan? i'll go friends yeah. partners uh comrades they just talked about their you know they do the the, the research updates they continually to do you want to talk about that how, how yeah. that's part of the service beyond i mean you get your seven racks a month but then there is also i think they did like 50 different articles in may so if you're subscribing i might be getting that number wrong double check it but it's like casual articles too. And they kind of do research updates on some of the companies that they've wrecked before. So I don't know, a little ad there and you can use our code CCM for $10 off at checkout. Yep. Then that makes it only seven bucks to try it out for the first month. So super easy to try it out. See if you like it. Code CCM. All right, Ryan, introduce GoodRx. Yeah. So GoodRx, basically the mission is to try to make high quality healthcare, more affordable. And so they're doing that in a few different ways, but it started essentially as a price comparison tool. So if, uh, and Ian, I guess we all have a good grip on it. So if I'm doing something wrong, feel free to correct me. But uh, basically if you've got a prescription from your doctor, uh, you can then look up whatever that medicine is on the GoodRx app. I think they have the second uh, best, uh, or the, the top, the second on the list of free apps in medical uh, on the app store, they're the second. So, um, you can use the app, you look up your medicine, whatever it is, and they're going to give you a price comparison tool of locations in your area or pharmacies in your area. And the reason that they do this is I didn't know this until I started reading it, but the pharmacies all have different prices, um, which I guess is a problem. The big the thing is that the, the market's the, the market is very confusing and inefficient. So there's a lot of ways they can help consumers. That's their value proposition. Right. And so they're giving you sort of the cash price. And even sometimes, even if you have insurance, you can still get a lower price with GoodRx at a different pharmacy or something like that. Um, and so they're basically giving that discount and you go to the pharmacy, you use their code. It's like a QR code, you scan it. And then uh, GoodRx gets a kickback from the pharmacy um, as, and that's basically their revenue. It's a small portion of the overall price, but obviously they aren't doing, there's not a whole lot of uh, expenses on their side with the transaction, except for the software that they have to build. Uh, but then there's also other elements to the business. So uh, they've now built out good RX care. They actually acquired it, um, which is like a telehealth provider. And then they have two subscriptions. So there's good RX gold and Kroger RX savings club. These basically guarantee even lower prices. Um, and then with gold, I think you get home delivery as well. But then the last part is a pharmaceuticals manufacturing solution. So the manufacturers themselves have to sell their uh, stuff as well. And so sometimes if there's uh, whatever a bad insurance deal or it's restrictive in any way, they can have trouble selling. So they offer their own affordability solutions. And basically GoodRx gives them a way to get that in front of more customers. Um, am I kind of describing that well enough? Are people understanding? I think it's understandable. Yeah, I guess I would mention that the GoodRx is nine bucks or 10 bucks a month for a family. It's like six, I think, for an individual. So pretty cheap per month. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a little bit about the history. GoodRx was founded in 2011 by three different people, um, Doug Hirsch, Trevor Bezdek, and a third guy named Scott Marlett. So apparently the company started because Doug Hirsch was trying to fill a prescription that he found alarmingly expensive. So then he shopped around, realized that the prices really vary. And so he naturally thought that consumers should have a one-stop shop to compare all the prices. That was sort of 
uh, the, the uh, inception of the business. And Doug was actually one of the first 30 employees at Yahoo. I know Ian's going to talk about this briefly. And he was the vice president of product at Facebook in 2005. Uh, and then m and has kind of been a big part of their history. So they acquired Hey Doctor in 2019. Could, I said impeccable timing here. I, I can't think of a better time to have bought a telehealth provider than right before the pandemic. Uh, but then they made several other acquisitions as well. Um, and they IPO'd in August of 2020. So I think they've had three quarters as a public company now. Yeah, they got a 10K out. So, you know, all the information should be up to date. There's a lot of information out there. Yeah, I'll hit um, industry landscape competition. In the 10K, they identify an $800 billion total addressable market. The majority of this is what their core offering um, and, uh, I don't know how important that is. I think that's just a rough estimate. It kind of shows how large the healthcare industry is. But when you, you look at it, they're taking a small, okay, it's kind of like saying someone like Visa or uh, MasterCard or Square or PayPal. They're, it's like identifying the TAM as their GMB number. They're really only going to bring in a small amount of that revenue, but still, it, it's a large opportunity. Yeah, and I think I read a number somewhere where like 70% of Americans don't use price comparison tools. So there's obviously still a large market out there for them to go after. Yeah, they still need to uh, educate the consumer, I guess is how they define it. Yeah, and the majority of this is from that core medication and prescription platform. So and then they have the telehealth stuff in there as well. Well, um, they identify Teladoc, Amwell, and other telehealth companies as competitors. Uh, and they don't really identify anyone as a competitor with the prescription price tools, I'm sure. And they mention this, that there's a ton of small players out there. They call it a really fragmented market. I'm sure people could name competitors out there, but there's no one really at the size of uh, GoodRx. And then Amazon is kind of a competitor. They, they've been launching some things. They bought PillPack, but really haven't done much with that. But, you know, Amazon, like they do, they announced a ton of things on that. And we'll see if they actually follow through, whether this uh, becomes one of their strategic priorities. But yeah, nothing else on industry. Um, Ian, do you want to talk about management and ownership? Yep. So as Ryan was mentioning, uh, Trevor Bezdek and Douglas Hirsch were a couple of the co-founders. They now serve as co-CEOs. Um, which is always, we always make, take note of it when we see that, um, it's a little bit, double double the stock comp. That's all, that's all I think about. (laughs) Yeah, definitely the case here. Um, Trevor Bezdek has a degree in biological sciences from Stanford. Um, and he owns about a little over 1% of the company currently, uh, as you mentioned with some stock comp that could about quadruple, um, and then Douglas Hirsch, as Ryan was mentioning, was one of the first employees at Yahoo, led product development. He actually left to travel the world for a couple of years, returned to Yahoo for a short period of time, and then joined Facebook in 2005, which, talk about good timing, you were talking about the telehealth acquisition. Joining Facebook in 2005 was pretty <laughs> pretty good timing, too. Yeah. Um, he also owns a little over 1% of the company with, again, kind of the opportunity to quadruple that um, with some options, incentives. Uh one of the things to note is this, I don't always cite this number, but Glassdoor had um, 96 approval or 96% approval rating of the CEO, which is a very high number. Generally on a lot of these sites, they the company's getting high marks for culture and the only downsides are, or the only complaints are things like, it's just growing so fast. Sometimes someone comes into my lane a little bit and things like that. So just kind of as to be expected with a fast growing company, but very high ratings, particularly for a fast growing company. Altogether, the insiders own about 44, or sorry, not 44%. Insiders own about 4%, singular 4%. Um, and a big, big chunks of the company are owned by uh, private equity firms. So Silver Lake owns 33%. Um, a company called Francisco Partners Management owns 22%. Uh, Spectrum Equity Management owns 12%. So a lot of, a lot of, um, big chunks of ownership from a couple of players like that. It'll be interesting to see and something to watch is whether those, I'm sure those position sizes will come down from those private equity players, but how fast those come down will be something to watch. And then the final thing I'll note, and I think we'll talk more about this later, but they had founders IPO awards, which were valued at $260 million a piece that were supposed to have some performance goals. And then it was about two thirds performance goals and about two thirds vesting over time but the IPO surpassed every performance goal in terms of stock price, which tells me they're pretty weak performance goals. And so all of that two thirds of it's already been met. And now it's just a matter of time vesting for the remainder of it. Um, so not a great governance 
piece of that, I don't think, but, um, you know, it is what it is at this point. <laughs> yeah. The, the best or the, sorry, those options, the, the founder awards they gave out kind of left me scratching my head when I saw those numbers. Uh, I was like, all right, well, we're already hitting that price. Like, I mean, we see even with, I mean, this is inspired by the Tesla one. Um, we've seen a lot of other companies do it. Typically when they start out, it means that the, you know, it, they have like a time weighted period and it has to go up. The stock has to go up quite a bit over a certain time period to hit that. But yeah, I'll hit valuation. Uh, market cap as of when I saw it, could be a little different today, was $11.9 billion. Ticker is GDRX. Enterprise value is slightly lower than that, but not by much. Price to sales is about 20.6. Price to gross profit is 21.9. Ryan will get into it, but the margins are really strong here. And then price to operating cash flow is 90.7. And just to give more context around some of these founder awards, they have around 22 million options and RSUs outstanding versus 392 million shares outstanding. So not crazy bad right after an IPO, but that will come in with some dilution if those best. Um, and yeah, watch out for those, you know, founder SBC chances. All right, Ryan, do you want to hit earnings? Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't even put gross margins in here, but they're north of 90%. Uh, it's a pretty asset-like business, but uh, their trailing 12-month revenue was 577 or 578 million. Uh, and then their Q1 revenue uh, grew 20%, which was a bit of a slowdown. And apparently the slower, gra- slower growth came primarily from, uh, th- there was weakness sort of in the prescriptions category, which makes up the bulk of their business. And part of that was due to a weak cold and flu, se- cold and flu season. But then there was also just less doctor visits in person, which is yeah. where a lot of people get their prescriptions. Everyone's focused on COVID right now. Because that's right. kind of the claim. And then, but the other their other revenue, which is more the telehealth providers, manufacturing solutions, and subscriptions, uh, grew 154% year over year. Um, and then net income was $1.7 million for the quarter. That's down from $27 million a year ago. Uh, they're making a lot of investments. And then adjusted net income was $31.8 million, um, also down from a year ago. They have around 27% uh, operating cash flow, free cash flow margins. Uh, but they spend a ton on stock-based compensation, or at least it looks like that right now. I'm not sure if that's something that's sort of perpetual or IPO related, but even general and administrative um, uh, marketing related, there was stock-based compensation and all of that. It's not just tied to the executive comp, um, but guidance was strong. They expect 36% revenue growth for the year. Uh, monthly active consumers reached 5.7 million, up 17% year over year. And they had 931,000 premium subscribers. Um, and then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's the second top free app in the app store for medical uh, apps. Pretty, pretty solid quarter, I guess. Not what people were expecting. I think there was uh, obviously sort of the uh, macro factors that played in, but- Yeah, it sold off a bit, right? Yeah. and got, Guidance still looks strong to me. Yeah, and then I guess the one concern is the that SPC stuff. Again, we, we've hit on it already, but that's just kind of the thing to watch out for. Um, Ian, you want to wrap things up with the balance sheet? Yep, and first on the SPC, um, we might talk about this a little more later, but I, I think the SPC is, oftentimes I don't like to say it's a one-time hit, but yeah. this looks like it's, it's mostly going to be a one-time hit and that they're not going to, at least it's going to be substantially lower than it was. It, a lot of this was related to the IPO. But as far as the balance sheet, about $991 million in cash, uh, $700 million-ish in debt. Um, the vast majority of that is a term loan, which accrues interest, um, and then they pay at the at the end, and they pay it back a little bit of principal each month, as, or sorry, each quarter as well. Um, has an effective interest rate of about 4% in 2020. It was closer to 29, or 6% in 2019. It's a variable rate based on um, kind of a base rate and then also uh, their net leverage ratio. And so the less lever they are, then the lower interest rate they get. Did you um, see they misspelled LIBOR in the 10K? They said yeah. L-I-B-O. I think they misspelled that. We got to get the auditor in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I guess it happens, but... Um, Can't the, buy it anymore. Or Grammarly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get on, get on Grammarly, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't need an auditor for that. But um, goodwill of about two hundred sixty-one million. Um, they are 
very acquisitive, or at least not very acquisitive, but pretty acquisitive. They made quite a few acquisitions. So the goodwill number is reasonable, nothing to to be alarmed about, but probably something to keep an eye on. As Ryan mentioned, there's going to be some more acquisitions in the future. And then a major dividend in 2018, which I'm suspecting is probably where some of this debt is from. So they pay, had a payout of about $1.1 billion, I believe, in um, 2018, that with some of these private equity deals, that's not entirely unheard of to see some some cash pulled out of the business. And I think that I think that this debt probably is related to that to some extent. Um, so but not not overly levered by any means. It's, you know, 700 million in debt on a, what did we say, 11, 12 billion dollar market cap. So yeah, so the there's two surprising things about GoToRex is one, it's very profitable for us, like a Silicon Valley type startup. And two, it has all this debt. Typically, you know, they're just raising money through stock options. So I guess, you know, it's fine, but it's just a lot different than a lot of these Silicon Valley companies. We Santa see. Monica. Santa Monica? Yeah, okay. Valley. Tech companies. Yeah, it's, guess, it's uh, right. I guess it's, it's just all all Silicon Beach. That's what that's what every all my LA friends are trying to get started is Silicon Beach down in LA. So. Okay. Silicon Beach. Uh, <laughs> we can, yeah, we'll, we'll, help, we'll help start the trend. All right, uh, let's take an ad break and then we'll get back for the second half of the show. Welcome back. Next up, we're going to hit quick product experience. Did you guys download the app at all? I did. In? I in? Did. You're welcome. I did not download the app. I went through their website and kind of watched some, watched some tutorials, but didn't download the app. Well, if they start touting download numbers, you can thank me because I did download <laughs> the app. Um, and I also signed in, made an account. Uh, I looked up uh, allergy medicine. I have allergies. Uh, gave me a nice price comparison. I might use it if I ever uh, feel the need. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, I downloaded it. Seemed like the app looked good. Uh, it was pretty intuitive what I you know, needed if I never needed anything. Yeah. It was offering these crazy drugs, but I was like, all right, I guess uh, the, if I prescribe these, like, maybe. Uh, like a platform where they can advertise, you know, like, uh, here, take this. Uh, I mean, it's kind of probably a bad idea, but uh, instead of prescriptions, you can just advertise medicine. Yes. Maybe in a different industry, <laughs> not this one, but overall, I mean, it seemed like the app was good. I don't know. Kind of hard to tell about using it. Uh, but let's hit competitive advantages. Uh, Ian, what do you have for good RX? So my competitive advantage is just kind of, it's partly their scale, but really their head start on generating these pharmacy and PBM partners, which are, those are the um, PBMs are the things that uh, negotiate with the pharmacies and with the drug manufacturers to set prices for insurance companies on the drugs. And so they've, they've have a lot of those partners, the more partners they have, the more price visibility, visibility they get into different regions. And so they've got a strong network there already that seems to be unmatched by anyone else in the industry. Like you said, there's some small players, but it doesn't look like anybody has the scale that GoodRx has. And so it just means all their prices, um, on average, their prices are going to be lower than their competitors. Yeah. Ryan, what do you have? Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, they, they kept touting that a lot, which was the sort of data advantage, if you will. Um, but uh, mine is less, I guess you could say, of a competitive advantage, but more of just a perk of the business model itself, the refill kickback. So customers only have to use the GoodRx code once. And then for every refill, GoodRx still gets that kickback. Uh, just makes the customer value a bit higher, especially since they are, I believe, the leading platform for these price comparison tools. Yes, I, I was trying to read in the, ten, I was trying to identify any competitors. Um, they And they said in the 10K, they're the only real competitors right now, at least at that time, were, were really small. So yeah, uh, I'd assume that's the case. What do you have? Uh, I have the... GoodRx being embedded into the physician workflow. So they mentioned this in the 10K. And if, so say they're the one source of recommendation, you're at the doctor's office, they help you look it up on Good GoodRx. Uh, they talk about, and the industry is so confusing, they use all the, these acronyms. If you're embedded in the ERH, which I think is the employee uh, something record health thing. Resource. No, electronic records health. So I some along those lines. Uh, they where you look a lot of acronyms. Yeah, too many acronyms. It's very hard to follow. It's kind of like the music industry where you're like, why are these people in this value chain? But yeah. they're still, you know, having them being embedded within the physician workflow where they're, pres- you know, giving out whatever this prescription or however it works. If they're not going to take 10 of these type of things, if GoodRx is solving the issue, they're going to stick with them. And it's a very easy way 
to onboard new customers without having to spend a ton on marketing on like Facebook or Google or something like that. Yeah. And I'll also, I, I watched a few uh, YouTube videos on it and it was like doctor based YouTube videos kind of explaining what GoodRx does. And a lot of them were sort of a testing for the product because they're judged on performance. Right. And so if they're uh, the doctors. Yeah. And so if the clients are sitting there not taking the prescriptions, then that's on them and, and it reflects poorly on them. So they want to give the best accessibility that they can. So they're probably going to try to recommend stuff like this. And a lot of them were recommending good RX, at least on these YouTube videos, even though it's anecdotal evidence, but. All right. All right. Uh, future growth opportunities, Ian. For me, I want to focus on uh, the telehealth opportunity. You mentioned the acquisition. Um, originally it was called Hey Doctor. They turned it into, they rebranded it as good RX care. Um, this provides affordable doctor visits integrated with their prescription services. So they can do, um, basically someone can sign up to have a doctor visit, talk about whatever's going on, and then per perhaps get prescribed, um, something to help with that issue. And so they say in 2020, more than 30% of visits led to incremental revenue through prescription offerings. So a good chunk of those are leading to additional revenue. And one interesting thing about them is instead of, um, as most of the telehealth providers work through insurers. Um, GoodRx actually works directly with the patients. And so patients just, um, they don't have to go through their insurer at all. They're just directly through GoodRx and signing up for um, appointments on their own, basically, and, and, and paying for them on their own. So um, it's kind of an interesting strategy, but seems to work well with their prescription offerings. Yeah, it seems like that's interesting, especially if they can get that uh, delivery service up and running, which I guess kind of kicks over to your future growth opportunity, right, Ryan? Yeah, I was going to talk about script cycle, but... Uh, honestly, I didn't totally understand what it, they were doing with it. It sounded like it was basically the same model as uh, GoodRx. So maybe it was just uh, acquiring the customers, I guess. But uh, the one I'm going to choose instead is the DoorDash partnership. So this is kind of interesting. I saw Ryan Reeves tweet out once that he would love to see a GoodRx partner would love to see good RX partner with DoorDash and gave four reasons. He said, one, pharmacies are like mini distribution centers for prescriptions. Two, good RX could utilize DoorDash's huge driver fleet. Three, would decrease the percentage of people who don't pick up prescriptions. And four, there's high predictability for DoorDash. Someone tagged Doug Hirsch, who's one of the co-CEOs in the tweet. And on the latest conference call, Trevor Bezdek stated, we have recently entered into a few exciting relationships which extend the reach of GoodRx Gold, including new partnerships with DoorDash to offer additional value to drivers in their platform and Groupon. Now, I'm not, I don't know if Ryan Reeves is responsible for this. There you go, Ryan. Nice. <laughs> but uh, it makes sense. And then the, I also saw another, it was a tweet with a picture on it where they were, Someone, the DoorDash driver was coming home or dropping something off and was like, do you want me to stop at Walgreens or whatever? So it sounds like they've kind of integrated this. I'm not exactly sure what the details of the partnership are, but it makes sense. It would help with delivery, make it faster. And yeah, I guess these, you know, these pharmacies are a bit like mini distribution centers. I just think is how many companies are going to be in this, in this supply chain at this point? Are we just going to get every company in the world until we get to the consumer? There I don't was, know, but it, make, it makes sense. There makes were sense. some concerns about like, yeah, you know what? I don't want some random DoorDash driver touching my prescription. Yes. But I, and I assume there's ways to sort of safeguard that. Maybe. And that's probably on DoorDash. So yeah, you go, it's fine for your RX, you know, if DoorDash has to spend money on that. But yeah, I'll, I'll hit my future growth opportunity. It's the Kroger partnership. Ryan mentioned that they have the subscription integration with people who are uh, customers at Kroger's pharmacies. So it's one of the largest in America. I think it was fourth and it gives them an inroad to a lot of customers with the partnership. I believe this could easily be repeated with a lot of large pharmacies across the nation. I'm not sure if someone like CBS or Walgreens are anti GoodRx. I don't know if it screws up their business model at all. I don't know enough about the industry to kind of know where, whether that's the case, but it seems like those partnerships should be coming at some point. Um, but I'm not sure. Maybe CBS will buy him. I don't know. You know, you know what I mean? It seems like this is a perfect acquisition for either CBS yeah. or Walgreens, but, uh, but who knows? Yeah, I agree. Highlights, lowlights, Ian. Uh, some highlights for me, I think it's a problem worth solving. Um, you know, prescriptions for many people are too high and it's an inefficient market as we've been talking about. Um, a lot of repeat customers, which just shows the strength of the product and uh, great revenue growth. I think analysts expect it to be above 30% for the next three years, which you don't see all that often. So it's um, 
good revenue growth in the past forward looking looks to be on a good trajectory. Um, some low lights, I, one of the big low lights for me with this is just how confusing this whole healthcare industry can be and how involved government is and might continue to become in this industry. And so I think that this is a company that should expect to be disrupted by the government by either changes to, um, current plans, or if we started getting more towards some sort of single payer healthcare system in the United States, I think, you know, that, that really kind of eliminates good RX's business model. And so I think that's something to be, there's just enough, there's a lot of macro risk here. Um, the founders IPO award seemed a little bit excessive, you know, but yeah, they all- I do like those. I like those pricing things that people do, but why so low? Why so like, low? Right. Been like two hundred. We were looking at some company the other day. What company was it that had um, oh. a thing set up like that? Um, but it was like Squarespace. Was it Squarespace? Maybe. Maybe it's Squarespace. And it was like you know they had to the stock had to go up like five hundred percent or something to hit the top goal, right? And it was like staggered across there, and that made sense, right? But when you're <laughs> when you're IPOing and immediately hitting all of the performance goals, uh, that's a little bit a little bit concerning. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing I'll say is. Um, and this will kind of lead into some of what Ryan wants to talk about too, I think, but it's, they're trying to fix an inefficient market. And I'm worried that at the end game for this business, that that might, they might be like making, if they make the market more efficient, then there's no need for good RX in their core business. Does the arbitrage go away? I mean, Ryan, you want to talk about that too? Yeah, it's my low light. Um, and maybe I'm just not, I mean, maybe there's good returns between point A and well, point Well, B. maybe the arbitrage can stay around forever. Who knows? Yeah, yeah but I mean, just the, like if you think about it, their goal is to make uh, is to grant for or uh, accessibility to low prices. And so, if you're driving all the like, let's say you play it out and it's successful and they achieve their mission and everyone starts going to the low cost providers, either the big pharmacies uh, struggle because of that and they whatever cease to exist or everyone competes on the same price then there's no value for good rx right yeah. so that's so, like it's sort of a catch-22 like the better you do the worse off your odds are in the future um and then my other low light would just be the convoluted system i have a hard time understanding what the incentives are for the various stakeholders well who holds the healthcare. value who holds the value i understand consumers are getting a better price and that makes sense but who is holding the who is holding the leverage here? Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm, I guess, I mean, if pharmacy benefit managers or whatever never budge on price and maybe arbitrage is there forever and there's just this sustaining inefficient market, but I, it's just convoluted. I don't quite understand it. That's my low light. Uh, but the highlights for me, the customer value prop is very clear. Uh, there should be operating leverage if I'm understanding it right. And, I mean, I think it's already there to be, right. you know, it's been there forever. Yeah, and I thought Doug Hirsch and Trevor Bezdek were uh, some of the better executives we've studied in recent months. Um, they seem top notch, uh, and they seem like they're actually, despite the uh, egregious compensation that they got from the IPO, it seems like they're in it for the right reasons because they were doing just fine. Uh, they got skin in the game. The they got skin in the game now. You know, I guess I that's a, that's a positive. That's the other side of that coin. Um, yeah, sorry. Do you have anything else? No, that's it. I would say, yeah, I think the one thing that could save them from this, you know, those efficiencies you guys are talking about, the worry about that is the subscription. Um, if it kind of changes to that, we're like, all right, we're, you know, that's kind of the ecosystem where we get people on there. It, it feels like that's where they want to go. And that's, it's growing really fast. So that could be saving them from that issue down the line, but, but who knows? And there's, if they are able to diversify before whatever that terminal data is when they've made the system efficient, uh, whether it's through telehealth, through the subscription, delivery, the DoorDash or delivery, uh, then I think it's a viable business uh, in the long run. Or you just get Teladoc to buy you out for a ton of stock, just like every other uh, <laughs> every yeah. other tech healthcare company. Uh, but I'll, I'll hit my highlights. <clears throat> You know, margins are phenomenal. I think there's probably a path to 40% operating margins unless the business changes uh, materially. Uh, value proposition, like you guys said, that's probably my favorite part. I mean, the consumers are saving tons of money. I think their stat is consumers have saved over $30 billion since GutterX is founding. And with only 5.7 million customers as of now, that's really impressive. And the number could grow substantially. And the track record of growth while staying profitable is really impressive as well. 
Uh, I do like how they're trying to embed themselves within the healthcare system. And I think that subscription part is pretty smart. Uh, low lights, you know, there's unknown dynamics to the pharma industry. I, I mean, maybe I just watched that uh, Purdue Pharma documentary on HBO. There, I just don't like saying we have this giant tan to give people a bunch of opiates. I don't know. Kind of weird to me. It feels a bit off. Uh, there was also so, another red sorry there was another red flag that they started talking about the backlog because people weren't going to the doctors yeah i i, I don't wait the backlog uh, doesn't make sense like if they don't get their medication then they either die or they didn't need it right yeah. i guess it's like time sensitive so maybe um, i'm wrong maybe there's like people that are just waiting and it's not something that's gonna or it's people who or it's people who can like survive without it but their life gets better with it right yeah. like it's kind yeah. of those yeah those quality of life type medicines, but I don't know, maybe the far, you know, the pharmaceutical industry obviously isn't all bad, but after watching that Purdue pharma documentary, I it just kind of rose me the wrong way. Anything associated with the industry. Um, and then also I saw this in the risk factors and this is a direct quote from them. Our business is subject to changes in medication pricing and is significantly impacted by pricing structure negotiated by industry participants. I am not sure what industry participants there are, Claiming, I think it's those PBMs, yeah. like you were mentioning, Ian, but that makes it seem like to me that GoodRx is relying on them acting cordially. Um, you know, does good over time could GoodRx get the operating leverage within that relationship? Maybe, but whenever you see a company with high profit margins, I think the one thing I think about it is all right, how defensible are these things? That's the most important thing. So that, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of why I think we're harping on this is because, all right, they have these fat margins. C could they go away? Um, let's see. I guess the other thing that really matters here is they identified a material weakness in accounting, identified in the 10K. Looks like they really just ne neglected applying the necessary resources there. So I don't think that's a big deal. It wasn't anything egregious. They didn't identify like anything that was faked, mm -hmm. but still material weakness is never great. But yeah, that's it. Lots of like, few concerns as well. Um, all right, let's hit more or less interested. Ian, what are your thoughts on GoodRx here? I'd say I'm a little bit more interested. I think the business model, like the margins you just ex explained, like it, it's just a, it's a good business model, clear customer value proposition. I just would like to understand the industry a little bit better and the dynamics and what really could change um, their advantage right now and what would what would cause them to I, I think there's some factors at play that could that are outside of their control yeah. um that could seriously harm the business and i'd like to understand those before i started a position myself yeah that makes sense ryan uh i'm gonna go a little less interested i know i know it's really easy to just throw it in the too hard pile but i think it's worse to pretend that i understand the space um, and even if I try to, I'm not sure who holds the power within that industry. Um, so it's going in the too hard pile for now. Yeah. It reminds me, we, we covered the last few months, a lot of these fashion platforms and stuff like that. And after doing all of them, it made me realize that all us, uh, all us guys on FinTwit probably don't understand the industry that much. I think healthcare in a more general sense, a lot of people don't understand. So that totally makes sense. I mean, I would say I'm more interested slightly, you know, the financials, like I think pretty clearly were stood out for us. It, it was great. Yeah. The valuation uh, isn't bad either. It, yeah. I was looking at them relative to companies that have similar gross margins and operating margins. I mean, it, it reminds me a lot of Adobe and Autodesk and Facebook and stuff like that, that trade in the teen sales ratios, just because they do have, um, you know, those phenomenal operating margins. But again, I, I mean, I think it would take me a long time to read, up on the industry. I tried once to read a book on the healthcare industry. It was like, read this book. You'll understand how everything works in America and how everything's screwed up and all that stuff. I got through like 10 pages and fell asleep. It was so boring. So many acronyms, so many things I didn't understand. So it's a tall task to get, to get this right. Although I do like when uh, something trades down on an Amazon and on an Amazon oh, announcement. I love that. Has, yeah. uh, played out pretty well if you end up betting on those companies so that's honestly been half of our <laughs> half of our investments in the past <laughs> stuff like that and yeah. it, it, those those of those have all worked out i guess again you know this uh, there's no okay would you be surprised if this is a hundred billion dollar business in 10 years no you it's probably won't it's just a lot of uncertainty yeah yeah and a lot of unknowns like 
there might be risks that we're not even considering. So yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. All right, Ian, what's the stock for next week? For next week, I think we're going to do carparts.com, ticker PRTS. Um, pretty self-explanatory, carparts.com, but an e-commerce play, small cap, under a billion dollar market cap. Um, nice. But we'll get into it more next week. Awesome. Nice. That sounds fun. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening or watching. Remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal, but formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I are general partners at Arch Capital. Arch Capital clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Again, thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week.